earth science, igneous rocks. Much of what we're talking about in this lecture, we don't went through with in, in plate tectonics lecture. So uh, this should be familiar to you, only this one, this time we're going to focus in on the type of rocks that are found in the different types of plate tectonic boundaries. And let's first of all look at uh, this model on this side where we have, um, again, the divergent boundary where we have uh, um, um, basaltic magma that is being derived from the mantle. And as the plates pull apart, that basaltic lava um, fills in that plate boundary. And as it cools, it forms basalt on the surface where it cools quickly and gabbro, which is the same composition as basalt, but has larger crystals um, underneath that. And that's the very lower, the, the floor of the ocean is made up of basalt and gabbro. It's a real dark, heavy looking, uh, dense rock. Um, then on the right side of your picture, you see a partial melting of the mantle and um, you have dense, low silica magmas that collect the base of the crust. And then as you have um, that melt, um, continuing to partial melt, you have rhyolitic magma and you have plutons that are large, um, um, you know, they can be miles and miles in, in width. Obviously, this doesn't, it looks like it's kind of small, but those can be miles and miles and tens of miles in width. Plutons that can just um, cool in place. And then if you have erosion, you can, you can then have that granite on the surface. Um, then it, like we talked about in the, um, in the plate tectonics group, you get andesite kind of, uh, magma coming in coming up from the volcanoes on these diver on these convergent boundaries where you have melting and so let's let's look at these types of rocks um, then a, another type of rock you see there is is metamorphic type rocks and those are listed but we'll get into those in in that lecture okay <clears throat> there's two main types of igneous rocks classified on texture and composition so we so that's already a clue. There's going to be an exercise where you're going to be classifying igneous rocks on texture and composition. First of all, there's volcanic rocks, and those form when magma rises to the Earth's surface, and molten rock cools rapidly. We also have plutonic rocks, and that's where uh, rocks cool slowly and underground so that um, the crystals in those have a chance to grow large. Granite is a plutonic kind of rock and um, um, that's why you can see the minerals in it because they grew. So if we look at these objects, how would we classify those? How would we classify those kind of objects? Lots of ways to classify things. Maybe on size, maybe on color, maybe on shape. Um, classify them as all doing the same type of thing too because they all hold paper. Uh, you can do them on spit, which direction they're pointing. Well we do the same thing with rocks. Rocks we can classify a texture which is basically the size of the crystals in the rock. If, if a rock, if an igneous rock cools quickly, and for, for example that would be like in Hawaiian volcanoes. You have basaltic lava that's coming out and spewing into the ocean. Well, rock that hits the water, or lava that hits the water, cools just immediately. So it would, would make just really, really fine microscopic crystals. And those crystals just don't have time to grow. Whereas rock that cools slowly underground, um, the crystals have a chance to grow. You can also um, uh, do it on color. You have, um, in this example, high silica, rocks, intermediate silica rocks, and low silica rocks. And high silica tend to be lighter in color, and low silica rocks tend to be darker in color. Um, 
So here's the different uh, types of rocks that we've been talking about. You have silicon content higher and intermediate and low. Granite is high in silicon, diorite is intermediate, and gabbro is low in silicon. That's the same thing with the volcanic rocks, rhyolite, andesite, and basalt. Notice the different minerals that are common in each of those. And remember when we talked about partial melting, that's because you get different minerals that um, are um, solidified at different temperatures. So here's a picture of a rock. In that rock, you can see this dark. So it's probably a basalt, so it would be low silica. And it's real fine grain, so it would be a low silica volcanic rock. Geologists sometimes find a type of igneous rock known as porphyry, which contains both large and small crystals. So the question is, what's the best way that you might have gotten a rock like that? It had a two-stage cooling process, so it initially cooled slow, and you had lots of big crystals in it. And you can you can see these when in um, like in people's countertops in their kitchens. There's there's some countertops where you have great big um, pink crystals of feldspar, which cooled slowly, and then the rest of it around it cooled rap cooled faster. You know. So it'd be a granite porphyry. Okay, so there's three types of magma, basaltic, andesitic, and rhyolitic. Basaltic magma is the partial melting of the asthenosphere. And you can see one there where, and in that divergent plate, basaltic magma um, um, comes up from a partial melting of the asthenosphere from the mantle below it. And acidic magma is a partial melting of, um, of, man of mantle rocks with water. And um, rhyolitic magma would be partial melting of continental crust. So there you can see where you get the three types of magma tied into different parts of the um, uh, plate tectonics. Bowen's reaction series is the bread and butter of igneous petrology. Petrology is the study of rocks, and igneous petrology would then be the study of igneous rocks. <clears throat> and this diagram kind of puts it all together regarding the type of minerals that you would find from different temperatures of magma. Notice that the highest temperatures are on the top, lowest temperatures are on the bottom. And you get partially melting from the top down to the bottom. And so if you partially melt Peridotite, which has lots of olivine in it, then you get a basalt or gabbro, which has lots of pyrexine in it. And if you partially melt a mafic rock, gabbro or basalt, you get a diorite or andesite that has a lot of amphibole and biotite mica in it. And um, if you partially melt the intermediate rock, you get a felsic rock or a granitic rock with lots of potassium, feldspar, muscovite mica, and quartz. Um, notice that there's a calcium-rich um, line on the right. Some, some magmas just have lots more calcium than other magmas, and so you get um, a plagioclase feldspar in, that, uh, in the minerals that are um, crystallized out of that magma if you get lots of, lots of calcium in that, in that lava or magma. Let's look at these three sources of magma. Um, uh, we've talked about this, but here's a cartoon. I really want to drive this home that you've got rhyolite and granite are the same composition, but one just has a fine texture and granite has a not a fine texture. And it would be made from um, a partial melting. Um, so you take andesite and you partially melt it, and you get rhyolite or granite. Uh, two, um, andesite and diorite would be the same composition. Diorite would be large crystals, andesite would be um, small, very small crystals. And in two, you take basalt and you partially melt it, and you get andesite and diorite. Okay, one cools slow, one cools fast. 
And then if you take peridotite, which is zero, with the, the mantle kind of rock, and you partially melt it, and you get basalt or gabbro. Again, basalt cools quickly. Fine crystals, gabbro cools slowly, or large crystals. So you, you kind of use this as a summary diagram. You, take, you start with peridotite, you partially melt it, you get basalt. You take basalt, partially melt it, you get andesite. You take andesite, partially melt it, and you get rhyolite. And what you're doing with partially melting each time is you're using that Bowen's reaction series and knocking out some of the elements. And because you knock out certain elements, then these elements recombine a different way and form a different mineral. So here's where we'd find the different boundary, different places where these rocks are made. Peridotite zero. Um, again, that is Cenosphere mantle rock one. Um, again, I'll just say the whole thing again. This time I use the large crystal rocks. You take peridotite, you partially melt it, you get a gabbro. Take a gabbro or basalt, partially melt it, you get a diorite or an andesite. Take an andesite or diorite, partially melt it, and you get a rhyolite or granite. I'm just going to show this again just because Bowen's reaction series is so important and um, it's, it's, just a, it's just a good summary of um, start with zero, go to one, then go to two, then go to three and the temperature changes as you go from zero to three. Here's the type of rocks you'd get from a composition standpoint. We've been talking about um, um, Granites, and unfortunately, the, the this thing's backwards, so that the gabbros and basalts are on the right, and the granites are on the left. Whereas the other ones, it was the other direction. But um, um, you just have to live with that. Sorry, <laughs> but uh, it's a good diagram because what it does is shows you the composition of rocks, so that you get uh, lots of quartz and potassium feldspar and pelagiclase feldspar and biotite mica and granite. But you don't really get any quartz in a diorite or a gabbro. You get lots of plagiocase feldspar and then what we call ferromagnesium minerals. Um, a ferromagnesium mineral, olivine is a good example because it has lots of magnesium in it. Um, here's a good summary of classification. It's got a lot of material on this diagram. Um, you get an exercise that uses a diagram kind of like this. And so here we start from the right and go to the left from partially melting of ultramatic or peridotite type of things. And the composition changes as you partially melt and then recrystallize rocks where you th think of uh, think of a great big soup and it's all melted. And then as it cools, certain things crystallize and fall to the bottom of that big bowl, of, that big pan of soup. And then um, those might get scooped out of there because they crystallize out. Well, then that changes the composition of the of the whole bowl of um, whole bowl of soup. Anyway, that's not a very good example, but that's how I like to think about it. That the composition changes of of the the big bowl as um, things crystallize out of it. So for example, the, the um, uh, let's take mafic, where it has lots of uh, pyroxene and not as much amphibole. Well, pyroxene starts crystallizing out and pulls out um, material from the, from the um, rock, from the melt, and then that allows an intermediate kind of rock to start forming. Um, so you have increasing potassium, sodium, and aluminum to the left, increasing silica to the left, those two pink lines, the blue lines, you get it. It gets heavier, increasing density, they're darker in color to the right, increasing magnesium and iron and calcium to the right, and increasing temperature crystallization to the right. Basically, it says the same thing as the um, Bowen's reaction series, just um, it's more clear on the kind of minerals that would pop out with um, the cooling of those Here's a start of a whole bunch of different slides of pictures of different rocks. This is a granite that has lots of uh, a sodium feldspar in it. Notice there's not much pink in it. 
Uh, there is some quartz in it. You can see clear crystals in it. So it's probably a quartz and probably a granite and not a diorite. If there wasn't any um, clear crystals in there, it'd probably be a diorite. This is a granite with lots of pink potassium feldspar in it. There's, it's kind of a typical granite looking. This is a rhyolite, same material, same uh, composition as a granite, only crystals are really small. Here's a picture of a diorite or granite or, or gabbro. Um, it's probably a diorite because it's just a diorite with lots of dark, dark minerals in it. Here's a picture of a basalt with lots of air bubbles in it. It's like the froth on a milkshake that just crystallized immediately. And, uh, but it is a basalt and um, it would sink if you, it's not, it's not light like pumice um, because those, there's enough rock material in it that it would sink. This rock is called obsidian. It's a volcanic glass. It's, it's basically the same as glass, only it's got some black impurities in it. And um, when lava cools immediately in, in water, it, you can get this kind of obsidian uh, volcanic glass forming. Notice, it, no, notice the conchoidal fractures, those round fractures, um, because it's, a, it's almost pure silicon. This is um, a scoria. And scoria is the type of rocks you put on trees for landscaping and stuff. Um, this has lots of color in it, but um, just makes it more interesting. Here's pumice, and uh, those air bubbles are not connected, so this floats. This is really a f very top of the froth of a, of a um, andesitic volcano. And if you take uh, Pumice, we can look inside of it and see bubbles, really small, uh, really small bubbles. And that's where the, uh, the, the um, froth cooled immediately. Uh, so pumice is, we find it all over the place, it's useful. So here's a question, name these igneous rocks and explain the reason for your choices. Well, we have a granite is A, basalt is B, C is rhyolite, and D is diorite. And the individual grains are visible in A and B, A and D, but not in B and C. So um, A and D would be um, plutonic, and B and C would be volcanic. Let's go ahead and complete some characteristics of volcanic as compared to um, uh, plutonic igneous rocks. Um, volcanic igneous rocks may form from basaltic magma, but so may plutonic rocks. It depends on whether they cool deep underground or on the surface. Um, volcanic igneous rocks are small grains. Granite is an example though of a plutonic igneous rock because it has large grains. Um, Form from melt, melting, well, volcanic igneous rocks um, form from melting, but so do plutonic igneous rocks. In other words, you take rocks and you melt it, well, depending on how you cool it, well, depending on whether it's volcanic or plutonic. Um, rhyolitic magma can form from volcanic but it can also form plutonic because remember, and I'm going to keep driving this home, volcanic just cools fast, plutonic cools slow, rhyolitic magma is the composition, not how fast it cools. Um, volcanic igneous rocks may form in the presence of water, but so may plutonic igneous rocks because remember water may be um, part of the uh, melt and create that partial melting um, uh, differentiation that comes from partial melting and thus form the andesite or the the, the um, andesitic material that um, forms at uh, compressional boundaries. Um, plutonic rocks are only exposed at the earth's surface after erosion. When they cool, they, they, they cannot cool on the surface of the earth and get plutonic rocks. And they take a long time to cool too. Um, 
It's one of the things that's interesting that the young earth folks don't talk about is how long it takes, say, to Pike's Peak to cool. It takes a lot longer than 6,000 years for that thing to cool. But that's not really discussed. Uh, volcanic igneous rocks form minerals, contain minerals, but so do plutonic igneous rocks. Andesite's an example of an igneous volcanic rock. It's not an example of plutonic because, remember, andesite and diorite. Diorite would be the plutonic igneous rock. Oh. Density of minerals, oh. volcanic igneous rocks would could have dense minerals, but so could plutonic igneous rocks. Dark colored examples have low silicon content in both, and only plutonic igneous rocks would contain visible grains. The um, volcanic igneous rocks would have microscopic grains because they'd cool so quickly. Here's a good example of lava flowing um, across the street, and this would be from Hawaii. So let's talk about lavas a little bit, different types of lavas. Lavas can melt and flow as a magma. Heat from a lava can alter the minerals it touches. In other words, that um, like metamorphism, or just bake it. Um, solidified lava always forms small crystals, and the smallest crystals are at air and water and the lava interface. So the smallest crystals are when that lava hits air or water. Okay, rocks with the same minerals can fill fractures and those fractures walls can appear altered by heat. And a lot of times crystals are large when uh, they fill fractures. Let's talk about filling these fractures. Here's a good example of hot magma that swells and bows and fractures overlying rocks. So you get pressure in that magma and it's cracking the rocks above it. And then it, the magma seeps into those cracks and um, then it breaks and those pieces fall down so it can break off those pieces and they can fall down in down into the and it can even if enough of that happens it can change the so here's an example of a magma that's um, pushed its way into sedimentary rocks above it um, the sedimentary rocks were there and then the magma came in and it's younger than those others remember by cross-cutting relationships from earlier chapter. So that pluton is forming coolant. That's a sill. A sill is an igneous rock that's in line with the sedimentary rocks, whereas a dike is cuts across the sedimentary rocks. So pluton is the great big um, rock that's cooling, and then a sill is in line with sedimentary rocks, and a dike cuts across. So here's some examples. That's a big pluton there that's then eroding away um, all those mountains and here we can see a big um, dike probably that cuts across I mean, it's just huge cuts across that other rock you can see that the uh, mountains are eroding away in the um, here we can see a big pluton that's sticking up. Um, it's Yosemite, I believe. And that's a um, igneous rock that's then become exposed, and we can see it now. And here's some people that are climbing up that Yosemite and sleeping on their way. Here is a plug from a inside of a volcano. This is uh, Devil's Tower in northeast Wyoming. And uh, that volcanic plug used to be the middle of the volcano and then the outside of the volcano eroded around it. And that's all hexagonal basalt is what, what it is. Those lines you see it are all lines of hexagonal rocks. Here you have a dike that's cutting across these other layers. It looks like it might be from the Grand Canyon. And here's a picture where you have a dike cutting across another igneous rock. So by cross-cutting relationships, the black there is younger than the lighter speckled colored rock. So that's the order of when those things came about. This is one of those right-click and click play things. So here you have water vapor 
coming from the solidifying magma that comes up through cracks and those veins um, with hot water contains lots of minerals in the hot water and then as it cools it solidifies in those cracks and so that's why you see so here's water coming down in and then it boils and it comes back up contains lots more material and then solidifies that's why you get um, all kinds of different um, lines and cracks and white bands of silicon in other rocks so there's a good example of that and here's a dike that goes across the uh, probably the Arizona desert and um, then you have a um, ancient plug of a volcano there but then dikes coming out from that volcano and radiating around it and here you have a um, a rock that then had a lighter colored rock forced its way through. Here you have a sill where you have sedimentary layers and then a uh, another igneous sill that goes right through the middle of those other sedimentary layers but is younger than the rest of them because it forced its way through the cracks in those sediment. So here's an example of that. We have sedimentary rock with uh, very small crystals, igneous rock, and unaltered sedimentary rock. And, and then you have large crystals, and you have metamorphic rock. Well, the difference is that, that igneous rock took a long time to solidify, and then so you have metamorphic rock next to it because it heated up that rock nearby. Earth science, sedimentary rocks. This is a lecture where we'll go over um, how sedimentary rocks are formed and how to identify characteristics of sedimentary Sedimentary rocks form as horizontal layers or beds and they're identified by composition and thickness. Older beds are at the bottom and younger at the top. There's three types of sedimentary rocks and we'll cover all of these in these, this lecture. Clastic sedimentary rocks, chemical and then biochemical sedimentary rocks. Uh, the, and those are divided by the type of material um, that uh, makes up the sedimentary rock. And there you again see some layers of sedimentary rocks and a couple of canyons. So the different places where sedimentary rocks that we call clastic are formed uh, are in alluvial, alluvial fans. And you can get sandstones and conglomerates formed in alluvial fans. And there you see one forming at the base of um, a fast-moving stream that brings um, sands and um, gravel off mountain sides of a mountain or a hill. You can get it in a mountain stream. Mountain stream will normally have a conglomerate because a mountain stream moves fast and they can move um, larger pebbles. A meandering stream will normally have sands and shales unless it's at flood stage because the water is slower and it won't move as big a material. Swamps um, will have uh, like shale and coal in a swamp, very fine clastic material. Um, coal is not a clastic sedimentary rock, but swamps can have both. Shale is a clastic sedimentary rock because it's, it's, it's like mud-sized particles in it. A delta can have sand and shale, and um, a delta, like the Mississippi River Delta, will have layers of sand and shale. A rise in a slope off the edge of an ocean can also show um, sedimentary rocks. Um, the type of rock that you can, a sedimentary rock that you can find in road cuts, it's called turbidites. Well, a turbidite is a um, a um, a formation where you get the edge of a, a slope or rise where it has a fast moving um, fast moving current that it's kind of like an alluvial fan only it's underwater and then a beach you can get sandstone on a beach and then sand dunes difference between a beach and a 
sand and, and a dune is that one's formed by water and one's formed by wind. And you can see a difference in the type of uh, the way the uh, sediments look when they're formed in either, one or the other. And then you can also get classic sedimentary rocks out in the ocean. Um, there's material that drops down from the ocean, down to the ocean bed, and it can form a chalk or a shale. It can also form limestone, but that's a, that's a uh, chemical sedimentary rock. So chalk or shale can form out in the open ocean. So as you might have been able to tell, a, a clastic sedimentary rock is a sedimentary rock that's been composed, that's composed of rock and mineral fragments. And it's the most common type of sedimentary rock. And um, there's three stages in its formation. A generation where it's where the material like the sand is generated. In other words, it's weathered off other rocks. And then that sand is transported or I'll, use, I'll say sand, but it's any clastic material. It's then transported to where it, it um, gets deposited and then it's the sand grains are stuck together or lithified and rock is formed from those clastic grains. So lithification is the process of sticking those grains together and cementing them together, just like um, taking sand and putting glue in it. So let's talk about generation. Here's a picture of Bangladesh with the Ganges River Delta um, coming down into the Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal. And the um, sand and gravel, silt, clay is um, coming off the Himalaya Mountains down in the Ganges River and the Brahmaputra River. And it's deposited. And so, um, so the generation site is where you're getting the physical and chemical breakdown of any rock because it, it weathers off some other sediment or um, some other uh, igneous or metamorphic rock. And the, that generation creates different size grains that then are broken up with transportation and further. Um, transportation side stage includes this sorting. Um, the faster the stream, the bigger the, gra the bigger the gravel it'll carry. And so you see the big coarse gravel in the middle of the picture. That means that was a fast moving stream or fast moving current whereas the finer sand was a slower moving current. Anyway, so sediments deposited when the velocity of the transport medium decreases. So again, with that gravel that we're looking at there in the middle of the picture, you had a fast moving uh, flood, and then the flood stopped or slowed down and it dumped the gravel where you see it. Um, there's a general rule of thumb that larger grain sizes are deposited first because as it slows down the the water will or, or wind will deposit the larger stuff first because it can't carry and then as it slows down it gradually dumps smaller 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 stuff so the very top layer is is very fine as it slows down to no current at all um, Sorting, the, the, the sand on the left is sorted. In other words, the grains are all the same size. The sand on the right is not sorted. The grains are not the same size. So we say we, the terms we use are well sorted versus poorly sorted. And uh, when sediment is transported, um, it will sort the material because the same speed of wind or water will tend to carry the same size grains. Again, the principle that larger grains are deposited first because they're heavier and they spill out, they dump out of the water or wind, and then the smaller grains are carried on downstream and then last are the very fine stuff. Here you have um, another clue on how, how long material has been transported, which is really important when you're looking at sediments because if you see angular and larger type of grains, clastic grains in the in the rock, then that's a clue that the um, the um, rock was formed close to where the material was generated. If it's rounded and smaller, it's a clue that the um, rock was cemented or lithified 
further away from where it's generated. And that's really important because um, then it helps you understand the type of environment. Remember with all those red squares, different types of environments around the around um, where uh, classic sedimentary rock can get created. Well, um, it's important to know whether, for example, the uh, rock uh, was deposited in a stream where it, you'd see smaller, more rounded type of sand grains or in an alluvial fan where you'd see um, maybe less, less well sorted and angular kind of grains. So you ask, um, why is that important? Well, if you're looking for oil, it's real important because oil is generated in some environments versus other environments. And depending on where the sand is formed, you might, it might be a clue to find oil or not because you can't, you're, you're looking at little clues down underground um, from looking at samples of rocks. And that's, that's what geologists do when they work, work to find oil or, or other um, and that's just an example. Um, you might use it for environmental um, clue too, as far as understanding what the geology looks like in that bed that's um, containing some type of, um, um, say, uh, nuclear waste or something. Well, in this slide, the the um, <clears throat> the rock name reflects the grain size. In a sense, sedimentary sedimentologies. Um, a lot more straightforward than igneous petrology because uh, we've we've seen a lot of sediments we've all played in sand um, we've seen limestone maybe on the side of our house or something like that well the plastic uh, types of sediment are mudstone or shale which are really fine silt or clay sized grains sandstone or sand sized particles and conglomerate or gravel and larger fragments um, Another word, and, and usually a conglomerate has rounded, um, rounded fragments you can see on the right, and it's, it's not going to be well sorted. Another word that's not on your slide is an arcos. Well, an arcos is a very angular kind of rock that looks like a conglomerate, but the rock grains are all angular because you might find that at a, uh, an alluvial fan where where the grains are not rounded and sort and um, weathered, you know, because what happens is these rocks go down a river and they get rounded, they get broken off, and then eventually, you see here rocks with different sizes, and so this is not just saying one's bigger, one's smaller. It's actually showing you the size, the diameter of grains, and so gravels over two millimeters and sand is under two millimeters and you go on smaller to siltstone and shale. The way to tell silt from clay is you take the, um, you take and put in your teeth and if the silt, um, if the silt snap, uh, um, if it's crunchy in your teeth, then it's a silt. If it's not crunchy, it's a clay. Um, when you get to be a geologist, you, you kind of get used to tasting things. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> transportation process sorts grains, so deposits may have a characteristic grain size. We've talked about that. That's just kind of summarizing what we said. And sedimentary rocks hold clues to the environment where they're formed, which, uh, which again I've said is really important when you're, say, looking for oil or something. Um, and we'll have some pictures of um, um, actual places where oil is found at the end of this presentation. Here is a um, picture of the Mississippi River Delta, and we're still talking about transportation. Um, well, transportation is an example of where erosion um, is is um, um, erosion begins the transportation process as a clastic material comes off the um, rocks where it's generated. And then it's moved by either streams or wind or glaciers to where it's going to be. Um, the size of the material depends on the velocity of the transporting medium. Um, and also depends on the 
type of transporting medium. A glacier can move great big rocks, whereas wind will not in water. Water can move really large rocks too, but just not very far very for very long. Um, depending on the um, type of landscape you're looking at will help you have an idea of um, what type of uh, transportation is happening. Here you can see the the um, the uh, Mississippi River Delta sticking out into the Gulf of, Gulf of New Mexico and carrying sediment with it. Rivers are uh, real important when it comes to uh, transporting clastic material and creating sedimentary rocks. And there's a lot of features in this river, believe it or not, that um, we'll be studying more about in rivers. But uh, if you look in the middle of the picture, you see that bar going out into the river. Well, that's uh, where you're going to get a, a uh, tr deposition of the rock forming. Whereas on the right side, the river's cutting into the bank, and that's where it's, um, it's, it's um, eroding either rock or, um, or dirt or the, the side of the bank there is just eroding away where it's being deposited on the left side. And as a river meanders, and that curve we call a meander, and that, again that's another chapter, as it meanders it's cutting into a bank and depositing on the inner side of that uh, meander. And then as you go up to the upper left side of the picture, that meander goes the other direction and it's doing it the other way. Well, that's important because that's uh, rivers are an important place where you get um, sandstone and shales deposited. And here's an example of a cycle. And notice it's one millimeter, or it's one meter. So that's about a, you know, three feet high that we're looking at. And as we look at that, we start to, and one thing you do when you take a class of sedimentology is you start to be able to identify the type of environments you see where each of those are deposited. And so you have a, um, in, the, in the bottom, about a bottom half meter, you have a deep channel where you have a coarse grain sediments and large scale cross bedding. So that's the deep channel of the river. Then the middle is the is a shallow channel, um, fine grained sand, small scale cross bedding, and then at the top you get a floodplain or mud and sill. Well, what we can see is that you just saw that river in the meander. Um, depending on what part of the river you're in, you'll get different types of deposition, and so you can look at the sandstone and and tell that it's been deposited in a river. And as opposed to, it'll look very different if it's deposited on a beach or in a in a uh, in a wind kind of carrying environment. Okay, some more about transportation. Um, here's a, another example we could look at of um, that water transporting sand, and you see the waves um, cross bedding where the um, water's transported the sand and then covered over it with other sand and left the waves in the, in the side of the hill. Let's move from uh, looking at rivers to looking at beaches. Just a little bit here about the kind of classic sedimentary rocks you'd find on beaches. Uh, there's a normal beach and there's a black beach. There's a green beach. And there's a red beach. The normal beaches are what we usually see. The other three beaches are on Hawaii. And the different types of rock that the beach got generated from and then transported to the beach um, affected what you uh, what color the beach is. Um, the normal beach would be uh, quartz and feldspar with uh, with um, shell material. The black beach would have been generated from basalt. The green beach would have been generated from a rock with lots of olivine in it, an ultramafic kind of rock, or a, um, a, a or a, a basalt that just happened to have lots of olivine in it. And then the red beach would be a rock that had lots of iron in it, so you get rust, and that 
that rocks oh, turns really red because of the rust. Um, beaches that we find in sand contain a mixture of usually uh, quartz and skeletal material from marine animals. Um, minerals commonly in, contain quartz and feldspar and, and you can see both next if you go to the beach this summer. Uh, look at some of the sand and you'll see clear sand grains, that'll be quartz. You'll see cloudy looking sand grains and that'll be feldspar. It'll be the pink or white depending on whether it's um, uh, high potassium pink feldspar or a high calcium kind of a gray feldspar or a or a high sodium a white feldspar. And then you can kind of sell, tell the shell fragments as well. Um, here's a black sand in Hawaii. Hawaii has lots of basalt because it's volcanic islands. Here's the Olivine Green Beach. It's another uh, beach in Hawaii. And the um, Red Beach are rocks that are full of iron. And this is another beach in Hawaii. So the iron's rusting out from those, from those rocks. Another place that you see plastic sedimentary rocks are lakes. And you can see layers in that lacustrine or lake deposit. And those lacustrine layers we call varves. And a varve would be an annual winter spring change so that um, you get a different type of sediment uh, deposited in a in a different uh, in, a, in a different season uh, the spring you might get spring floods and they bring in more classic material whereas in the uh, fall and winter uh, it wouldn't get the flooding and so you just get a real fine material and so you can see one one layer to the next and one of the um, papers that we have um, with the, the old earth creation society that we give shows a lake in uh, Japan that has a hundred thousand of these annual layers which means that the lake deposits go back a hundred thousand years and you can actually count the layers back that long. Okay wind is a important factor in looking at um, transportation and I want to show you what kind of uh, cross bedding you expect to find with wind. So in wind um, here we have wind on top of the ground and then it erodes the sand as the wind blows and leaves uh, the pebbles because the wind isn't strong enough to move the pebbles in this case where it is strong enough to move the sand. And then as it, as it moves the sand away it, it forms what's called a desert pavement because you're just getting the, the pebbles on top of the ground. The wind has transported away the finer grant. And here's an example of de desert pavement. You can see lots of, um, looks like iron rich rocks. Another example of desert pavement. Winds can blow silt and when uh, fine grain silt gets blown and deposited, uh, we call it loess. And so here you have a transportation of silt that got deposited and there's a road cut above the Mississippi River Delta. Um, here's an example of transportation of dust that gets caught up in the wind off the Sahara Desert and if that dust builds up and gets deposited we would call that a loess. But you can actually see it, see the dust in, from space getting blown off the Sahara Desert and then um, now, now loess isn't where it gets dumped into the ocean and deposited. I'm, ju I'm just saying that um, dust can be transported. Uh, sand can get transported too by wind. And here you have sand dunes. Uh, you can just tell, tell whether something is a sand dune or whether something's um, deposited by water by looking at the grains. So here we have a wind direction blowing sand. And as the wind continues to blow, it moves sand from the left to the right and gets deposited. And the 
wind direction then changes and the sand starts going and builds up direction changes back and forth and you get a deposit that looks like this so that looks very different than what you'd find in a um, uh, when we looked at that uh, river deposit because the river deposit you can tell a cycle as a meander goes across the river of the deep channel then the shallow channel then the floodplain as that meander moves meander moves across very distinct whereas here you have real uh, very well sorted sand grains in other words the sand grains all the same size and you can tell that the direction moved back and forth and you do not absolutely don't have those um, those cycles that you'd expect to see in a river and it's, it's very clear when you do sedimentology that um, you can see uh, see layers that match the kind of environments you see and it works really well and it works really well to use those environments to go tell geology it's it absolutely does not work just to, to look at rocks like this and then to try and figure out a, um, a catastrophic flood geology model for all the sedimentary rocks that we find around the world it, it just does not work and the difference between these water deposits and wind deposits is a really good example so let's talk more about lithification because we just showed you a picture of lithified wind um, sediments We've We've moved from uh, generating um, generating the material to then transporting the material to then lithifying it. Well, this is a really good picture of where you get rocks that have been, uh, or, or sand grains, let's just say sand, could be anything, but um, sand that gets compacted. And then when it gets compacted, um, they can have um, cement that gets crystallized in between the grains and then those grains get started to get stuck together and then you can have multiple generations of cement where it sticks those grains together so in the example lithification here's our sand dunes that um, that uh, are getting uh, um, getting transported. By the way, you should be able to look at that and tell which way the wind's blowing from that little picture. Looks to me like the wind is blowing from the from the right to the left. And so then those sand dunes get stuck together and it looks like this. Okay, so there's classic sedimentary rocks and we're going to move from there on to our next type. But just to summarize, you can get like alluvial fans, mountain streams, Henry streams and the type of rocks that you'd find in a, each of these environments, you'd be able to, they look very different. And um, this kind of summarize what we looked at to start with on the type of environments where you'd find clastic sedimentary rocks created. Um, okay, so looking at this diagram, Weathering transportation deposition can, can can occur during steps two, four, and eight. In other words, when um, igneous rock is is uh, is eroded and creating sediment, and then four, when sedimentary rock is eroded and broken up to create sediment, and when eight, when metamorphic rock is eroded and broken up to create sediment. Let's look at this picture here and make some observations about the grain size. We talked about, and I said it a few times in the lecture before, faster moving, in, in this case it's going to be water, this is not a wind deposit. So faster moving water will deposit the um, heavier, the bigger um, conglomerate um, grains because it can, faster moving water can carry more stuff fast enough gets fast enough it can move your house move it pickup and just another big grain if it moves the pickup which is why you don't want to drive through a flood in your car because it will pick your car up like a big rock and 
flip it over and you'll drown. So be careful. Even, even in uh, Northwest Arkansas, it can do that. So just be careful. Okay, so here we have three coarse layers, the two fine layers. So there's five different layers here. And so we have um, three flood layers and two um, kind of normal layers where the sand is deposited by this stream. So just to summarize, distinct layers, the different size materials, size of the grains would relate to the velocity of the water that deposited them. So you have five layers. So you have normal flow and then you have flood conditions both. One, two, three, four, five layers. And that's, that's one of the fun things you do when you're out at a road cut is you start looking at the road cut and then you go down the street and look at another road cut or go to another part of the state and look at another road cut and you start to put these pictures together to get an idea of how they relate to each other. Okay, so now we're going to talk about chemical and biochemical sedimentary rocks change subjects. And so swamps, you can get coal deposited in a swamp or peat. Peat might be another... It's not doesn't say peat, but that would do, do that too. Um, they can be deposited in a delta, or you can get a reef, a limestone reef. You can get rock salt deposited in a lagoon. You can get limestone deposited on a shelf. You can get limestone deposited, chalk or limestone. Chalk is a biochemical rock deposited out on um, the open ocean. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is salt, and it's a salt in the floor of an ancient lake in, in Utah. Well, salt will crystallize out when you have water that evaporates, and then it leaves the salt behind. And that can happen um, when you have a lake that might um, get, uh, get stranded. So it, water flows in, but water doesn't flow out. And then it starts getting hot, heat go, you know, and so, so you get lots of water coming in and there's nowhere the water to go. So it just leaves, the water evaporates and leaves what's in the water and, and all water contains a little bit of salt in it and, and other materials, not just sodium chloride. I say salt, I, I mean in any, anything that will um, uh, be dissolved in water. We'll call it salt. Well, here's where you get a lot of salt in deposits that make really good salt. Salt makes really good um, oil reservoirs. And when we talked about plate tectonics, when uh, Africa separated from um, South America, it left. Um, there's lots of salt that got deposited because it didn't just separate quickly like you see that. There would have been lakes left that had water running into them and then salt got built up and then um, that salt then got buried. Um, you can find, if you, if you go to Israel and float in the Dead Sea, it's very, very salty. Well, that's a good example of the kind of lake that you'd find in the very early process of when Africa broke up with um, the South America, where you get that uh, pulling of the plates apart, just like you're getting today in uh, where the Dead Sea is. And by the way, we call the salt deposits in evaporite. The chemical sedimentary rock, the official name is evaporite, is evaporite. Okay, the light, I'm just showing here that the light blue is where you'd have conditions of the early breakup. If you look at that carefully, you can see light blue right at the beginning where it starts to break up. Okay, here's the, um, the way we get salt beds, uh, the same the process I just talked about where you get evaporation from a lake and then when that when the water evaporates the salt doesn't evaporate and it gets deposited down and then it gets covered over then what happens is that 
pink area, kind of the bottom of the picture on the left, we'll look at that picture first, it gets covered over by other, other, um, other uh, sediment. And the weight of that sediment pushes the salt. Salt is not a very strong mineral at all. And so the weight of that, the sediment pushes it and then salt tends to be lighter and it tends to push up above and go up into the other sediment. And so you see on the lower right side of the picture that salt gets pushed up and it starts to squeeze those other sediments up. And where the sediment pinches out in the salt makes really good uh, oil traps where oil gets trapped. And I'm going to show you some pictures of geophysics um, places in Angola off the coast of West Africa where oil is trapped and you get lots and lots of oil trapped with that salt. Okay, again, we're going to, talking about salt here. Um, this is a, a, um, <clears throat> a geophysical line looking down into the earth off offshore Brazil. And the west side of that Atlantic Ocean that broke up. So this is, this is um, looking for oil. And there's a red oil um, rig where you drill down into the into this um, into this uh, area, and then you on the right side you have another another um, red line that says projected. It's probably a projected oil well, and this is from a few years ago. So you get depth on the left side, six thousand feet down into the earth, fifteen thousand feet, thirty feet, thirty thousand feet down into the earth. The red at the bottom is most likely um, igneous or metamorphic rock. And all the colored areas above that red area are sedimentary kind of rocks. Well, that big area in the middle is called is salt. That's you've got um, maybe ten thousand feet of salt that have been deposited, and you've got sedimentary rock below the salt. You got sedimentary rock above the salt. Now, I just showed you the mechanism that where that salt gets deposited and then squeezed around in the, in the previous two slides. And I just want to say it is not possible for that salt to be deposited there from by a flood. Flood geology absolutely will not help you find oil um, in salt deposits because it does not work. Um, but this is really a great picture of how you um, see salt getting moved around by the overbearing weight of sediment above it and then being used in the oil industry to then go look for oil. We see the same thing off, off um, salt off Gulf of Mexico. And so here we are in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is a top down picture, not a side picture. And the black areas have salt near the subsurface and um, they're just oil wells all over the Gulf of Mexico that are drilled down into that salt because oil will not go through the salt. It gets tra trapped in the salt and then um, you can drill down into it and pump it out. Same with natural gas. So here's a picture of salt in the Gulf of Mexico. Again at the top it's about 5,000 feet under the ground under the earth and uh, so about a mile down and then 40,000 feet, um, you know, th three, three miles down uh, at the bottom of your picture. And then that purple is a salt bed. And you can see where the salt has moved because the weight of the overbearing sediment is so strong that it's, it's moved. Now those wavy lines, those are all the edges of different uh, sedimentary formations. And um, you can kind of follow the edges of the sediment based on the wavy lines in the picture. Um, here's another example. And here's an example of an oil well that's drilled down into um, down 15, 20,000 feet and drilled into some formations that you can see those colored lines, yellow, red, yellow, blue, green, brown, and red are pinching out into the salt bed. And you'll see the same same, same uh, formation on the other side of the salt bed. So if you're a geologist, you'd be saying, okay, maybe I found oil here on this well, 
maybe I want to buy the land on the other side of the salt bed and drill down and uh, see if there's oil on the other side in the same formation. And that's where it's really important to know your sedimentology because then you can know, well, this formation had oil in it. The other, from the other side of that salt dome might be the same formation. And so I go looking and using my principles of clastic sedimentology and chemical sedimentology with knowing something about salt and then I'm highly successful finding oil. Another picture from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's called a big, very successful field called the Mars field. And there you see salt on both sides of, um, of a uh, an oil field. And that salt is keeping the oil or natural gas from coming out on both sides. And it, also those beds pinch out in um, probably that purple is like shale and clay and the blue is salt and so you get a combination of sale, shale and clay and salt keeping the oil and gas from going anywhere and then you can you can drill it let's talk about um, composition of the sedimentary rocks and what determines the composition of the uh, chemical sediments in sedimentary in uh, chemical sedimentary rocks First of all, it has to do with the concentration of ions. Some minerals form only at very high concentrations, and we talked about salt and vaporites quite a bit, and some at low concentrations. And here we have barite, BaSO4, and halite, or NaCl, as two examples of different types of ion concentrations that create two different types of um, minerals. Also, the temperature of uh, can determine what mineral precipitates. Aragonite will uh, precipitate out in warm temperatures, whereas calcite will precipitate out in cold temperatures. Water pressure will affect whether or not you get a chemical sedimentary rock. Calcite is stable in, in, shallow, in shallow water in calcite it dissolves in deep water so and that's because of pressure there's lots more water pressure down deep and so calcite can't form down deep that's why you get uh, limestone reefs um, coral reefs limestone reefs in shallow areas but not in deep ocean so deep ocean sediments rarely contain calcite because of that principle and also the presence of oxygen will affect whether or not um, you get a pyrite or a hematite. And you get an iron pyrite and you see it's FS2, not, there's no oxygen in that um, because it's a sulf, it's, an, it's a pyrite, it's a sulf, sulfite. Um, and then on the right side you get a hematite because you get iron and oxygen combined together. And then also the presence of organisms. And the presence of organisms tells us that we have a biochemical, not just a chemical sedimentary rock. And macroorganisms would be organisms you can see with your eyes, like clams or oysters or plants. Um, you can find um, uh, coal would be created in a swamp made out of plants in that swamp. And then you also have microorganisms, whereas they'd be really small um, shells called tests, and um, they might be mic microscopic organisms that leave reefs behind. And they, those oozes um, um, from th things like swimmers, foramini forams is short for foramini foraminifera, it's a microscopic animal that can create an ooze of calcium carbonate or um, silicate. Um, calcium carbonate would be in shallow ocean, and again because of pressure, but then deep ocean you can have an ooze of silicate. Um, you'd find coral reefs in shallow tropical seas, and then we can find limestone reefs 
that are made of coral reefs and we call that coquina. It's just a word for a limestone reef made out of a or coral reef or lots of shells. Um, you can see the different types of clams and other types of shells in that coquina at the bottom. And so here's a coquina at the top. Coquina is limestone formed from broken shell fragments. And uh, down at the bottom is a coal seam, which is carbon rich rock formed from compacted plant remains. Very different environment would have created each one of those types of sedimentary rocks. One a reef environment and one a, uh, one a swamp environment. By the way, at the top, that coquina, would that have been transported very far? Well, the answer is no, because it would have broken those shells up because you, those shells would have been little teeny pieces if they'd been transported very far. So those, those shells were generated close to where they were then lithified. Aha, now we're getting the three areas, trans generation, transportation, or generation, transportation, lithification. And cocaine is a really good example of, of where you don't get a lot of transportation. Okay, this is a chalk. And chalk um, is forms of billions of coccoliths, which are round plates of calcite from microscopic coccolithophore organisms. And this is um, the, uh, the famous cliffs of Dover. And the whole cliff there is made of microscopic chalk organisms. And here's where you get that on the English Channel, where you get a bloom off the coast of France marine organisms in the geologic past um, um, were used to have that uh, cliff created. So <clears throat> if this is the site of our um, rock that's being deposited, the very top of that um, rock has the living organisms and then the bottom has abandoned homes and we might find that like in a coral reef. The very part, top part of the coral reef has the as the uh, coral polyps and each each one is a separate little organis organism but then underneath um, it'd be the rock that's been lithified and stuck together um, because those homes have been abandoned and those homes might be coral might be shells and all kinds of things and here we see a good example of that um, we have extinct uh, clams and uh, looks like rugose coral it says clams, but it's clams and rugose coral. Those long skinny corals are a, one solitary coral. That'd be a really interesting bed to go to. And you can see that that um, black thing in the middle is there for size. It's a compass is what it is. And here's an example of microscopic organization, the form foraminiferin. There's a needle, and those things fit into the uh, eye of a needle. They're so small. And here's a bloom of foraminiferum that would be creating biochemical sedimentary rocks with, with that type of organism in I mentioned An Angola a little bit ago. On the left, you've got an oil well log, a well log from a well and what you do with these is you drill your oil well and then you hire a company to put a tool uh, you know a reader thing that goes down to the bottom of the oil well and it measures how much gamma rays or um, other they have all kinds of measurements that they can do to figure out what it looks like and um, so there you see limestone at the top then you get salt, and then you get sand and mud underneath it. I just want to make the point again, because an evangelical church has so many people talking about a young earth and flood geology, you absolutely cannot have this type of formation in a flood where you get limestone over salt, which is over sand and mud. And um, sand and mud can be a flood deposit, but salt and limestone cannot just like we saw above. The uh, mud kills the coral reefs and salt dissolves in water. So.
this is a, a well that's drilled, you know, one of thousands of wells drilled off offshore Yangil well. So this isn't anything different in, the, in for geologists. This is bread and butter for geologists. So just to summarize our different environments again, we get swamps, we get deltas, we get limestone reefs, we get lagoons, and um, there's a shelf that's not a reef, and then you get open ocean with chalk. Earth science, metamorphic rocks. Here we see the same picture we've seen before, um, showing us all kinds of different rocks, big rocks in this lecture. Well, metamorphism is when you take and make changes in the mineral composition or texture on an existing solid rock. And those changes happen with temperature, pressure, and presence of fluids. So you can get metamorphism because of changes in temperature, changes in pressure, or the presence of fluids, mostly like water. You add water. And we, we talked a little bit about this when we talked about plate tectonics. And again, well, we're going to get into that in a lot more detail in this um, actually pretty short lecture. Um, temperatures are high, have to be high enough to promote chemical reactions, but not high enough to cause melting. And depending on the rock and the conditions, that temperature would be between 200 degrees centigrade and 1100 degrees centigrade. Um, and you can find similar temperatures deep in the crust or near magma chambers. It just, just depends. And there's two types of metamorphism. We have contact metamorphism, where you can think in terms of like your hot stove, something that's close to the heat would be close to that contact and um, like close to a magma chamber where you have hot magma and the rocks around that, they, they wouldn't necessarily all melt, but they'd be baked. And that's where you get marble. Marble comes from contact metamorphism where you have magma heating up limestone that's close by. And it changes the, changes the, uh, structure, the mineral structure of that um, calcium carbonate or that limestone. And then you get regional metamorphism where you have um, rock that's say buried under mountains and the weight of those mountains pushes pushes minerals together and so you see A, minerals pointed different directions and then you get minerals all squeezed and all point um, uh, perpendicular to where the pressure is. We call that foliation. And, it, it, and you can, again, if you look at people's kitchen counters, sometimes you can see the granite is kind of strung out. Well, that's because it's been, it's had regional metamorphism, um, uh, push those layers out kind of sideways. Either that or they, sometimes they get remelted and then they um, get strung out after they get remelted a little bit. Um, increased pressures and temperatures cause tabular minerals to take on a preferred direction we call again that foliation and again you can see a granite at the top and then you can see a metamorphosed granite or metamorphosed rock we call that gneiss. Now it's easy to think of granite turning into gneiss but actually gneiss can, can occur with um, like a sandstone. You can get um, a sandstone can be uh, remelted and, and then can become um, a nice, nice kind of rock also. So it's not just granite that turns into nice because it's basically the same kind of composition. And here's a nice picture of where you different, get different types of um, different types of rocks from different types of uh, metamorphism, starting from left to right. You get a low grade of metamorphism. We might call that slate, where it, you get lots of regional metamorphism where it's low pressure and if you increase the pressure down deeper under those mountains in the picture you might get a phyllite and a phyllite is just you take that slate and you just like grunge it up more I like the word grunge when you talk about metamorphic rocks because that's really kind of what you're doing you're just grinding them up grunging them up baking and squeezing them and <laughs> just pushing them around. Then you take that phyllite and you, um, you cause it to go deeper under the 
under with higher pressure over it and it creates a schist and even deeper would be a nice so you get some great words there slate fillite schist nice again we're still talking about the two types of metamorphism we're talking about regional metamorphism um, higher temperatures and pressures yield more intense metamorphism grain size increases with the degree of metamorphism and you can see the picture above if you if you go back to it nice has bigger grain size because it has higher metamorphism this is a diagram that's um, complicated for presentation um, you should have this on one of your exercises as a handout. But it, it kind of shows you all the different types of rocks and metamorphic rocks and where you get those kind of metamorphic rocks based on whether it's regional contact metamorphism, what the composition is, what the grain size is, what kind of texture you get. The bottom part are non-foliated, but non-foliated would be um, mostly contact metamorphism. And the foliated ones would be a, a regional metamorphism. And so this is a good good place to study the different types of metamorphism. So some questions. The conversion from bread to toast can be seen as an analog to the formation of a metamorphic rock by contact metamorphism because the, because the bread is close to the heat. Using a George Foreman grill to make a hot sandwiches or paninis can be seen as an analog for the formation of a metamorphic rock by regional metamorphism because you're, you're taking a pressure in that thing together. So complete the table by identifying which of the characteristics are present in rocks formed by contact or regional metamorphism. Well, both, I've already got a check there, may originally have been an igneous rock. And both could form at temperatures above... Uh, 200 degrees um, centigrade, like 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 shale for like slate for example. Um, regional morphism forms from increasing pressures. Um, contact metamorphism where, might be where you have a plutonic igneous rock, and it's hot. But then that can also occur with regional metamorphism, so you have a um, a plutonic, a, plu a pluton is just really deep, and um, it's part of that um, metamorphism that deep down. Your slate is a good example of regional metamorphism. Um, <clears throat> regional metamorphism may underlie several adjacent states. In other words, it goes a long way. Um, contact metamorphism is found in mountain belts, but Mostly you think of that as regional metamorphism. And contact metamorphism or regional metamorphism may affect sedimentary rocks. Regional metamorphism is pretty much for foliation because of that squeezing. Marble's a good example of contact metamorphism. Um, you can have some marble with regional metamorphism though as well. Um, contact metamorphism is pretty much only found on the Earth's surface. And you can metamorphose metamorphic rock. Either way, with contact or regional metamorphism. Earth science, uh, chapter on rocks. And this is a lecture about the rock cycle. Well, the rock cycle links igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks together. And the th important thing is that any rock can become any other rock under appropriate conditions. If we start in the lower left and work our way to the right, um, you can have um, magma that melts other rock and some of that magma can form plutons and um, you can get contact metamorphism forming that nice um, uh, marble that we use on our the sides of our buildings and um, <clears throat> The magma can rise to the surface and form volcanic igneous rocks. So the plutons eventually, when they um, solidify, would be granites, as an example. And the magma solidifies to form of volcanic igneous rocks would be um, like an andesite. And then rocks at the surface are exposed to weathering and erosion. 
and then clastic sediments are transported and deposited by streams, rivers, glaciers, ocean currents. The rocks are broken down into sediment and then you get chemical or biochemical sediments that form precip by precipitation due to changing physical conditions or the actions of organisms like um, um, foraminifera or things like that or, or um, coral reefs. Well then sediment is lithified to sedimentary rock as it's, as it's buried and then if it's buried enough, increasing heat and pressure in the deep burial may um, um, create regional metamorphism and you get metamorphic rocks where it's deeply buried sedimentary sediment rocks. Now what's shown, not shown on this is then those rocks can then be remelted and put back in as um, magma. So here we have the rock cycle and basically it says the same thing I just said with some nice pictures on it where you have magma and um, you kind of follow the arrows and follow the pictures and it shows all one type of rock going to another type of rock. Magma crystallizes to form igneous rocks which then erodes creating sediments. Those sediments can be buried and metamorphic rocks can be um, um, created from that burial, which then they're melted again. We're going to drastically change subjects here and talk on three slides about mineral resources and a couple slides, just two slides in oil and oil and coal. And just want to talk about how you get mineral resources where you do. So, for example, why do you get gold where you get, or platinum where you get, or, or, um, why do you get aluminum where you get? In other words, these minerals that we use are so critical to modern technology that God's provided for us in rocks and minerals. Um, why, why do you get them where you do? Why do they concentrate where they do? Well, erosion, transportation, and deposition can, can create a comp concentration of minerals, and that's one way we can find them. You can, you can get minerals by, like, you can get gold just with enough ocean water and eventually get gold out of it, but it's not economically viable. Whereas if you get a concentration of them, it is. You can also get a chemical reaction. So first was concentration of minerals. Another one was a chemical reaction by changing temperatures and fluids, uh, movement of fluids through rocks. So concentration of minerals. Minerals can be deposited not just because they're concentrated in one place or because you get a chemical reaction helping concentrate them in one place, but they can crystallize at a certain temperature and by crystallizing out at a specific temperature you can get them concentrated in one spot. So um, transportation can concentrate them in one spot, a chemical reaction can concentrate them in one spot, or crystallizing at different temperatures can concentrate them in one spot. So that's why you might get minerals one place and, and concentrate in one place, those three things. So that's what's important to know. Transportation of, um, of um, chemical reactions and then crystallizing at different temperatures. You know, one slide here just to kind of summarize the oil discussion. Um, different traps that you might use to find oil or gas um, where you have a um, the blue is in the upper left, blue is the shale, and you have oil floats on water, and so it's trapped up in the shale. In the lower left, you get a unconformity, and the uh, sediments butt up against that unconformity, and the oil can't go through that, so it's trapped. Again, it's floating on the water, and there's water down in the rocks under, under the earth. Um, and so the upper right picture, you get a fault with a, a rock that nothing can go through, and the sandstone with, that has pores in it that has oil in the pores, oil floats in the water and then gets trapped, and so you can drill down in there. Same with the, the sandstone pinching out of the, in the shale in that lower right picture. Uh, it takes millions of years for oil and gas to form, and it does not happen quickly and overnight. 
Um, then one slide here on coal. The U.S. has some of the largest coal reserves in the world. Um, different types of coal. You have lignite coal and bituminous coal and anthracite coal. Notice that um, um, anthracite coal, you don't really get... Anthracite coal is a metamorphic coal. It's a very high grade um, coal that forms underneath deep mountains. Most of the coal that um, we burn is uh, bituminous coal and then lignite is a really low kind of dirty coal that you'll, you'll get in, in some formations.